Thank you for making time uh, for this training presentation. We very much appreciate it. Uh, we want to make this time as valuable for you as possible. So uh, certainly if you have any questions, you'll need to write them down because this is recorded. Just uh, write down those questions and feel free to email them to me, joe.napoli at gamalux.com. This is the tutorial video for the Gamalux Sales Representative Training Presentation. You'll notice that there are eight or, uh, or so icons here at the bottom of the screen. Each of those icons is, uh, uh, is a different path uh, for this presentation to follow. However, today for this presentation, we're going to be staying on the representative uh, icon, which means that we will be uh, using all the slides that are appropriate for sales representatives, project managers, quotes people, uh, things of that nature, pretty much anybody at the sales representative uh, level. Now, as I go through this presentation, you're going to see all the slides that all of your customers would normally see, but of course there will be a few slides in here that, uh, that are really uh, specific to your particular needs, and of course we'll address those uh, as, we, uh, as we go through. So let's just go ahead and get started. Gamalux is a family-owned company started in 1987 by a father and son team of design engineers. And this is the shot of their very first uh, facility after they moved out of their garage <laughs> after the first uh, six months or so of the business. Uh, they found themselves a, a storefront and, and uh, uh, turned it into a, a factory. Uh, so, uh, so for the first uh, several years of, of the company's existence, they were in Monrovia, uh, California, just about uh, 10, 15 miles or so east of Los Angeles. Uh, right around the... Uh, uh, Early to mid 90s, the company moved to San Dimas, California, uh, and you can see that uh, here at the top of your screen. Uh, so we, San Dimas is about oh maybe 22, 25 miles east of Los Angeles, uh, and about uh, 25 miles west of San Bernardino. So uh, here we are in Southern California. Got a lot of sunshine here, which is really nice. We don't have snow days where we have the factory shut down and things of that nature. So. Uh, uh, we do get the occasional wildfires in the, in the mountains uh, just north of us, but it's never really caused a problem for us here in, in the more populated area where we are. Um, you'll see that uh, out to the far uh, east of us, we have Palm Springs, a very nice uh, um, getaway opportunities there for, uh, for weekend excursions to come out and visit, uh, visit Gamalux and then, uh, and then head out to Palm Springs for the weekend and, and enjoy some time with your, with your customers. Uh, to our south, of course, we have San Diego, also a lovely, uh, just a beautiful place. Um, and then, uh, uh, of course, to our west, we have the Pacific Ocean and all the great things that that, uh, that, that has to offer. So we do encourage people to bring their guests, uh, um, their, their customers and specifiers and, and uh, distributors, even contractors, uh, out to come visit us and, and uh, see how we operate and learn something about Gamalux and then enjoy the, uh, enjoy the weekend together. Uh, so that's, that offer is always available to you. This is our facility. We are uh, occupying five of the eight bays in, the, in this uh, industrial complex where we are. Uh, we have, there are two buildings in this complex. One of them is here, and we have all four of the bays in that building, and then uh, we have one bay in the adjacent building uh, next to us. So um, we are not, a, uh, not, not so much a garage company anymore, uh, but, but we do like to do things in a kind of a personal way, and I think as I go through this presentation, you're going to see uh, how that translates to, to really to value for you and, and for your customers. Uh, this is some of our factory staff here, probably about uh, maybe three-quarters of our factory staff. Uh, I would say um, most of these folks have been with us easily more than five years. Uh, probably half of them have been here for, uh, for more than 10 years, and I'd say maybe a quarter of them um, are coming up uh, 15 years plus, and I can think of a couple uh, that have actually been with the company for 20 years. Um, uh, one of our uh, inside uh, people, um, our, our uh, production planner, has actually been with the company for 25 years. So that is just, just amazing out of the now 31 years uh, that the company has been in existence. So I think that says something about um, – uh, how people enjoy working for a manufacturer um, says something about how we treat them, and uh, uh, and it's good for people to to have a place that they, they kind of call home. And I hope that uh, I hope that you found that where you are as well. Um, at Gamalux, we have a set of core values that drive what we do and how we operate, and and the true that's true for you as well. For every person, for every family, for every 
company, every organization really has a set of core values, whether they know it or not, whether it's posted on the walls or if it's just something that's implied or, or a motto that they, that they have. Um, and these core values drive us as, as humans. It's, it's the glasses through which we see the world, and it's the megaphone by which we project our ideas out into the world. And so it's important for us to understand our own core values and, and kind of remind ourselves of that uh, every once in a while because um, – uh, sometimes you, you, you lose sight of, uh, of who you are as, as, a, as a person or as an organization, and so you have to kind of get yourself centered again. So we, we do uh, um, reevaluate our, our core values and, and, and reassess um, our actions based on those values. And the first is collaboration. It's important for us to understand what's going on, not just uh, uh, here at the factory, but also obviously out there in the world. You know, we, we don't want to work in a vacuum where we just kind of come up with ideas and then tell everybody, well, this is what we have to sell. Rather than that, what we want to do is understand what the needs are out there. And, and they do change. Uh, they change not just uh, um, as time goes by, but they're different in different parts of the country, different markets, because there are different ways of doing things uh, locally. And, and you'll even find that maybe there's a cultural difference where you are now versus where you were maybe with the, uh, the competitor that you used to work for or, or, or whatnot. So, so it's important for us at Gamalux to, to, to understand the core values of the people that we're working with. And there's a lot of similarity, of course, but sometimes there are differences. And so uh, as we understand those things, we're able to then uh, tailor our solutions to meet those needs uh, more, more appropriately and more, and more effectively. So collaboration is a very important part of, uh, of our core value system. Quality, of course, has to be high on that list. Uh, obviously, um, you know, you can, you can sell anything with a, you know, w with a pat on the back and a, and a lie and maybe buy somebody a beer and they're going to, you know, send you their next job. But you're never going to get the second job that way, not, not unless you're really meeting their needs. And, of course, quality has to be a very important part of all that. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, attention to detail here and a lot of quality assurances uh, here at Gamma Lux. That's not to say that we don't mis make mistakes. We certainly do. Uh, sometimes things go wrong, but um, uh, quality has to be uh, a, a, a key value, a core value for, uh, for I think, for any organization or, or person in, in how they operate. And of course, uh, last is integrity. Now, that's not to say it's the least important core value, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it's the one that we have to, um, uh, it kind of supports everything else. Um, integrity is a very important part. Of, of, of how we operate. And, and you need to know that, uh, that we as an organization want to do things with integrity. We want to do things right and in a conscientious manner. Um, sometimes things go wrong. And when they do, you need a manufacturer that's going to raise their hand and say, you know what, we made a mistake. We're going to figure it out. We'll make it right. I don't think all manufacturers are like that. As a matter of fact, uh, I know that they're not. Uh, some of them don't even answer the phone. Uh, some, uh, it's very difficult to get a hold of somebody, especially if something went wrong and it turns out that it was their fault. And of course, you at the representative level, well, you're stuck between the, the customer and their problems and the manufacturer who's not responsive. So it's very important for us as a manufacturer, as a conscientious manufacturer, to have integrity in how we operate and, uh, and to step up and make things right uh, when things have gone wrong. Our most popular product line is the G-Beam or the Gamalux Beam series of fixtures. And this is that group of square and rectangular forms that have been so popular in the business for the last 10, 15 years or so. And, uh, and of course, you may represent other manufacturers that have similar types of products. There's a lot of, uh, of this type of thing in the market these days. But what makes our product so popular is not the shape and the size because, like I said, everybody's got kind of the same stuff. There's a lot of overlap between manufacturers. So as a manufacturer, it's on us to try to figure out how are we going to create value. Well, it's not by making a different square or a different rectangle or, or, or putting a, a slightly milky white lens into the fixture because that kind of stuff, you know, the truth is when you come up with a new product, and you take it out to Light Fair, you show it uh, out to a few customers, it's not very long until your competitors have the same stuff. Uh, and and that's, of course, that, that's, of course, why there's so much similarity between manufacturers these days. So uh, now that's not to say that we don't want to uh, uh, come up with new products. Of course, it's on us to, uh, to continue to develop new products. But rather than trying to beat another manufacturer on product, what we want to do is we want to create value. And sometimes that is made by the product itself, but other times it's made within the project. And so as I go through this presentation, you're going you're gonna to hear a lot about 
creating value within the project. And this is, I think, is a key uh, to, to how to be successful with Gamalux. It's not about the product so much as it's about the project. And here's what I mean. Our G-Beam product is so popular, not because of the shape and the size, but because of its ability to adapt to complex applications. And this is where re really where we want to set ourselves apart as a manufacturer and as an organization by understanding what's going on in the space and then allowing our product to become part of that space, to lend itself to the overall design of that space. Here's what I mean. In this application here, you can see that the wall and the ceiling don't actually touch each other. That's very unusual, right? You, you know that most walls and ceilings touch each other. But in this particular case, the architect uh, doing this job for Schindler Elevator Corporation headquarters remodel, uh, where they make elevators, well, the architect wanted to convey the concept of the ceiling floating up and down on rails of light. Well, it doesn't really move, but, uh, but the architect wanted to convey this concept. So, uh, so by having a fixture embedded into the wall and then into the ceiling with a, with a nice transition between the two, it kind of gives that impression. So. As, you, as we look at this uh, at, at closer at this detail, because there's a gap between the wall and the ceiling, well, that means that you can see the side of the fixture. And this could be a real problem because, see, if you use a recessed fixture up inside the ceiling, which makes sense because it's a recessed application, but if you've ever seen those recessed fixtures when they're not installed, they're not very pretty. They're not very attractive on the side or the top of the fixture. And they're not really meant to be. They've got grooves and brackets and holes and all these apparatus that are on the sides or the top of the fixture so they can interface with the ceiling. And of course, the intention is that those stuff is never really meant to be seen from below because the fixture is recessed up into the ceiling. But in a case like this where you've got a gap between the wall and the ceiling, you would look up inside that gap and you would see all of those little doodads or the, the brackets and holes and flanges and things, and that's a no-no, right? You can't have the architect or, God forbid, the building owner walking that job site uh, you know, on punch list day, and they're walking the place and they're, saying, they're pointing up at all these problems on the side of the fixture saying, what in the world is this? And you're the one that represented it. You're the one that maybe even recommended the product, and now you're the bad guy. So we're not going to put you in that position. What we do is we're going to modify a standard fixture so that it can be used up in that space. It's not a custom fixture. As I go through this presentation, you're not going to see any custom fixtures, maybe with the exception of one or two, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain those and, and, and why, they would be that, that, why that would be the case. But generally speaking, we're going to take a standard product. We'll just modify it a little bit in order to meet the needs of the space. So here's a, a suspended, uh, this happens to be a four inch wide, four inch tall fixture here, which was going to be uh, uh, used in that space. And we're going to take that suspended fixture with the smooth sides on it, and we're going to modify a portion of that fixture with whatever brackets or flanges or whatever's necessary in order to, to interface with the ceiling just in the area where the fixture is going to do the interface. And of course, we remove the cables and we'll add a knockout in the top of the fixture for the, for the power uh, supply to be added. But you notice that we don't modify the end of the fixture, and this is really important. So that when we've got that modified fixture, we can actually include that, uh, uh, install, have that, that modified fixture installed up into the ceiling. And as you're walking down the corridor, rather than seeing the grooves and the flanges on the side of a fixture, you're going to see this area here, the nice smooth side of that fixture. And by doing that, we take a standard product, we modify it a little bit in order to, to accommodate the special needs of the space. And we do this kind of thing quite frequently. And honestly, that's where Gamalux really shines. It's in our ability to modify our products in order to provide value within the project. Now, uh, here's a couple warnings. As you, as you promote this kind of uh, idea, you know, these, these fixtures that are coming up the walls and across the ceiling, there are a lot of manufacturers that do this kind of stuff. And so your, your customer may already be familiar with other manufacturers that are doing it, or as the job goes out to bid, and maybe we're the first name spec, and they're trying to find alternates or whatever, somebody's going to come in with a lower price. That's guaranteed. Somebody is going to come in with a lower price than Gamalux. And here's what you have to be careful of. See, those lower price uh, alternates sometimes do things in a very sloppy way. They don't do things in the same way that we do. And let's talk about this. See, here you have a fixture that's been embedded into the wall and then a separate fixture that's embedded into the ceiling. It still provides that idea of fixtures coming across, up the wall and across the ceiling. But because it's built in as, as two separate fixtures, this fixture that's up inside the ceiling, well, it's going to have end caps on it. And the end cap of the fixture that's up in the ceiling is going to be visible in the corner between the wall and ceiling fixture. And so what you'll end up with is by you, you've got a manufacturer that can technically say, yes, we've got a pattern of fixtures that can come up the wall across the ceiling, but the presence of that end cap kills the aesthetic in the space. Now that's the case if you've got the fixture uh, uh, 
up in the ceiling butting up against the fixture that's in the wall. But it could also be the same case if you've got the fixture that's in the wall butting up against the bottom of the fixture that's in the ceiling. So either way, in either of these two conditions, when you've got two separate fixtures trying to create a pattern, you're going to have an end cap between the two, and uh, that end cap is going to be visible to your customer, and that's a, obviously that's a no-no. Now, you've got to avoid this kind of stuff as well. See, if you've got two separate fixtures that are being ordered, and the manufacturer maybe doesn't know that the two are going to be used uh, together as a pattern, then they're going to build them as individuals. And now it's the installing contractor's responsibility to try to figure out how in the world they're supposed to get this stuff to, to fit up in the space. And you know, the truth is, sometimes these contractors, they don't have the highest skills. So you've got to be careful about this kind of stuff. Now, there, obviously, there are a lot of really, really good contractors, and they're going to coordinate with the manufacturer, and they're going to try to you know, come up with good solutions and all that. But not everybody has that kind of integrity. And so you have to be careful that, that you don't end up with a cheap installation. So at Gamalux, we're not, going to, we're not going to put you in that position. Now, as this job is going through the bid process and people are trying to find alternates to Gamalux, maybe there's another manufacturer that's going to make two fixtures but with a miter joint up inside the corner. And in, in theory, that could work where there's no end cap that's going to be visible, but it's now going to be the installing contractor's responsibility to come up with a, 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 a good uh, joining of those two fixtures. Miter joints very rarely work in reality. Works great in theory, but not so much in reality. So what we want to do is we want to actually provide you two fixtures that are actually going to work. We're going to give you a, an L-shaped fixture that comes up the wall and actually across the ceiling about six inches or so. And so it is that portion of the fixture here that we, that we make out of that suspended fixture that's been modified to be recessed. Uh, all of our fixtures, whether they're recessed or suspended, uh, if it's a four inch fixture, they have exactly the same aperture uh, between the recessed fixture and the suspended version. It's exactly the same, so you always have aperture continuity or consistency in all of our fixtures. Now, because we're building this at the factory as an L shaped fixture, we are controlling the angle at the factory, and it is going to be a perfect 90 degrees. Now, for the installer, what they're going to do is just take this, this uh, ceiling, re pardon me, uh, they're going to take that ceiling recess fixture, and there's just going to be a simple butt joint right here. Rather than them trying to put together a miter joint or, or two fixtures with end caps, and they have to try to align things, which never works, we're going to give them the mechanisms that they need so that they can actually do good work in the space, so that at the end, everybody wins. That's the goal of this. It's not about making a sale and making a dollar, obviously you've got to pay the bills, but what's more important than making the sale and making the dollar is, is allowing the, des the des designer or the distributor or the contractor to do their best work. And when you put people in the position to do their best work, they're going to then rely on you in the future as a, as a resource, which is a position that, that we all want to be in. We want to be resources to people rather than just somebody uh, who, who kind of leeches off the job. So, uh, so this is why, um, why uh, Gamalex operates the, the way that we do. Now, here's a very complex pattern of fixtures where we've got a suspended uh, fixture. This one happens to be three inches wide, five inches tall, but we, we can use this with, uh, do this with any of our suspended products. Uh, it's not really about the product here that I'm trying to con convey, but it's the concepts. So here you can see in the reflection in the glass that this is actually one pattern of fixtures weaving its way through the entire floor of that space. Now, if you think about all the parts and pieces that are going to be required in order for a pattern like this to be put together properly in the field, it can be overwhelming. What ends up happening is because every distributor and every contractor has a different interpretation of all the parts and pieces that are going to be necessary to, to be ordered, you're going to receive different quote requests. At the, uh, at the sales office. And so you never really know what's the proper uh, 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 bill of materials to order because all the distributors and contractors, they're all, they all have different interpretations of all the parts and pieces. And of course, the more complex these patterns get, the, more, the greater the chance uh, is that, uh, that there will be errors. Now, nobody wants to create errors on their job. Okay? Distributor, contractor, you, me, nobody. Nobody wants to create errors. And sometimes what ends up happening is because there's so much potential for error, then the, the bidding, uh, the distributor, the contractor, what they're going to say is, you know what, we don't want to get involved in this. This is going to be too hard. So let's just pr let's promote uh, straight runs or individual fixtures that are not going to go, you know, they don't have to be uh, uh, joined together, uh, you know, in, in this complex way. And by doing that, uh, um, 
they, they simplify the process uh, for themselves, but what it ends up doing is it, it eliminates the great ideas that the designer had and, and, and this wonderful uh, uh, aesthetic that the owner was going to get in their space. And it's all because of fear. See, unfortunately, fear is sometimes a core value as well. And when people are driven by fear, we see this all the time, when people are driven by fear, they usually don't do what's best. What they do is what's safe. Okay, so what ends up happening is, is the, the design gets dumbed down, and uh, of course it, it decreases value for you at the sales office level. It decreases value for everybody. So what we would want to do at Gamalux is we want to give the tools that everybody needs so that they can actually do good work and still maintain these wonderful designs. So our solution to this is to provide what we call a development drawing to the, uh, uh, to the specifier at the very beginning. What we'll do is we're going to start with their original design, and we will translate that into what we call a development drawing. It's the same drawing that we would provide after a purchase order, but we're actually going to offer it to that specifier before the job even goes to bid. Now, what this does is it takes all of their, uh, uh, their, their original concept and translate it, translates it into an engineered drawing with all the power feed locations and the mounting locations, all the dimensions as we know it at this time. Now, we know that there will be changes. We know that there are going to be differences between how the draw job is originally drawn and how it actually has to be built because sometimes the walls in the space are going to move over the, pro the, the process of, uh, of designing that space or um, whatever, any number of reasons why these changes would, would occur. But what, what this does for us, it allows us to establish a common understanding of what this pattern is. And you'll notice down here that we're actually applying one part number to the entire pattern of fixtures. So what we're doing here is we're eliminating all the complexity of that job by, by eliminating the bill of materials that would have been necessary in order to order the 22 different components for this pattern or the 13 different components for that pattern by giving it one part number. And we will also give you one quotable price at the beginning of that job. So now you can take that quotable price back to the specifier. And so as all the bids start coming in and somebody says, oh, this is going to cost $45,000, uh, but the original, you know, our quote for the thing was only $2,000. Well, okay, somebody's got their hands in the cookie jar here, right? And it's, we don't do this to try to make people look bad or try to call people out for their business practices, but I don't want to lose a job just because other people feel like they have to inflate their price in order to self-insure themselves against potential problems that they're going to have to pay for later. We want to eliminate those problems so that everybody can do their best work, keeping everything very simple, taking all that complexity of that job, turning it into something simple. I call that simplexity. That's my word. If you want to use it, you have to send me a quarter <laughs> every time you uh, – or, or just you know, keep, a little, keep a little tip jar on your desk. And when I come into town, you can buy me, uh, buy me lunch. All right, so um, uh, now these, these development drawings, because it's included as part of the bid package, now every bidder, every contractor, every distributor, they know exactly what this thing is because it's already been factored in. It's already been worked out at an engineering level. And again, this part number, uh, this entire pattern has one part number and one price, which cre creates a very clear understanding and eliminates fear, which I think is a very important part of doing business. Now, as far as the procedures go here at Gamalux, I want you to understand how we operate. We're going to receive a purchase order on, let's say it's January 1st, okay, just for sake of argument. Um, so, uh, so. Uh, on January 1st, we receive a purchase order, and then we're going to create a, uh, a set of approval drawings. Now, depending on the complexity of that job, it could take anywhere from 2 to 10 working days. And, of course, you know that when we're very busy, it's a little bit longer. And if we're not busy, shoot, we might be able to get the thing out the very next day. So it just depends on, what's, uh, uh, on what, our, what our conditions are. Now, once we, send, once we uh, create those approval drawings, two possibilities could happen. Those drawings could be approved immediately uh, by, the, by the installing contractor uh, where they say, yes, this is exactly what we intended to order. The, the mounting positions are in all the right locations. The, the power feed is exactly where we want it to be. The color is correct. The color temperature of the, uh, of the, of the LEDs is exactly what was specified. Everything's perfect. So they're going to approve that drawing. It usually takes about two to 10 working days for us to receive that approval. So once we receive that approval, well, now we've the, the order has been released to production, and the, our production, under most, most circumstances, runs anywhere from 20 to 30 working days. 
And of course, as you know, there are always exceptions to this, but just this is the general, uh, the general statement, or the general rule. Now, if for some reason the drawings were not approved because there were changes required, well, it usually takes us about two to ten days to receive those instructions back. And so, of course, we're going to have to revise our drawings because the bulk of the drawing was already done. Now it's not going to take us two to ten days anymore. Now it's probably going to take us one to five days to make those corrections, again, depending on how much work is in the engineering department uh, and, uh, um, uh, and how complex those changes are. So then, of course, we will send those changes back to, uh, uh, to you uh, so that you can send them to your customer. And again, um, uh, they're going to go through that approval process. Now, if for some reason more changes are required and then we make new drawings and, oh no, now somebody forgot the fixtures are supposed to be suspended five feet from the ceiling instead of four feet. Well, that's another change. And, and oh, well, we, now we, we messed up the voltage or, or the, the color temperature of the LEDs. Somebody decided to make a change. So on and on, these changes could happen and could just keep us in this continual, ridiculous, frustrating cycle of having to make changes to these drawings. Now, we will not release an order to production if the drawings are not correct because those are the actual construction drawings. That's the blueprint by which we are going to make those fixtures. So it's imperative that the drawings be accurate. If we, go, if we just release orders to production and the, and the drawings are incorrect, and then you know, we're, we're, we're halfway through production, and then somebody comes to us and says, oh no, the dimension has to change, that throws everything off. Not only does it harm that job, but it harms every single job after it because now everything is delayed uh, you know, uh, as we go through production. So one of the re many, well, actually the exclusive reason why most of our orders are, are ever delayed is because of either changes to that order or to the orders that were before it in the production cycle. So it's so important that we get good information. And if you need us to communicate with the contractor directly, we'd be glad to do that. Or if it's the lighting designer or engineer or whoever has the answers of how we're supposed to build these fixtures so that we can do good work as quickly and efficiently as you think that we should should. And this is necessary in order for us to, 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 to run a good business and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and have good experiences. And of course, once that cycle of drawings is finally done and finally approved, then we can go into production. And again, it's going to take about 20 to 30 working days. So good information is, uh, is, is just critical for us. Now, when we ship those fixtures, remember how everything, all the, all the, all the components in that pattern they all have one part number. So how are you going to know how, how we differentiate uh, all the different portions of that pattern? And that's, what we, uh, that's by what we call mod numbers or module location identifier number. We apply this mod number here at the factory to all the different components that are going into that pattern of fixtures so that we can identify exactly where they're supposed to go. Now that mod number is going to follow each housing throughout the entire uh, uh, construction process. Now, as we, uh, as we go through construction, those mod numbers identify exactly where everything is supposed to go. Now, everything that we build, whether it's a complex pattern like this or if even if it's just a 40-foot run, of a, a straight, straight run of fixtures, everything we build is fully assembled twice at the factory before we pack it and ship it. This is very important for you to understand. See, we don't deal in theory. We can only deal in reality. And if something looks like, on, 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 maybe in a CAD layout on the computer, it looks like everything's going to fit together perfectly, we don't just rely on that and just build everything and put it in a box and ship it out and, and expect it to work. We actually test everything before it's painted to make sure that everything lines up properly, that the joints uh, attach properly, that the corners all have the proper angle. Then we take the whole pattern apart, paint it, put in the electrical, and reassemble the entire thing. Now we're, che we're checking every circuit, we're checking all the battery packs, we're looking at the, at the consistency of the lens diffusion throughout to make sure that the whole pattern doesn't just uh, perform the way that it's supposed to, but also looks the way that it's supposed to. And this is why our lead time is what it is. I know that not all of our competitors do this. But it's important for you to understand the procedures that we go through to ensure that everything looks and works properly so that you don't have problems at the job site or you're not getting phone calls because things aren't fitting together. This is very important that you understand as our representative, it's important that you understand why we operate the way that we do. Now, once those components actually get to the job site, of course, the contractor has to know where everything goes. So each fixture is marked with that location identifier. We put that location identifier on the end of uh, of the fixture, on the bubble wrap of the fixture, on both ends of the carton, 
so that if you're looking at one side of the palette or the other side, you know exactly what, uh, what's inside that carton. Then we take a photo of that palette before it ships out. This is to ensure that if somebody says, oh, we're missing, uh, uh, I don't know, module uh, uh, W3, well, we can say, okay, well, it was the fourth row down and, and, and fourth in from the left or, or, I don't know, seventh or eighth in from the right, depending on what side of the palette you're looking at. But we do this not to make people look bad because they, weren't, you know, they lost at the job site, but we don't want to have to do that work twice. See, when we say, okay, it was the fourth row down and here's the photo showing where it was before the, before the pallet shipped out, now somebody's getting slapped at the job site because he didn't look thoroughly for that, uh, for that carton. And, and you know what? Nine times out of ten, we never get the second phone call because they found it. And again, it's, we don't do this to make people look bad, but we don't want to do this work again. And, and, and have all this lays associated with that. So this is why we operate uh, in, with, with these thorough uh, procedures. Now, the, the, uh, along with that pattern of fixtures, we're going to, to send out the drawing all over again, only this time it's going to be marked up with the mod numbers. So again, the installing contractor knows exactly where everything is supposed to go. Now here's a pattern of wall-mounted fixtures. And you can see this is uh, two inches wide, four inches tall, bi-directional, but it could have been any one of our products. Again, I'm not really talking about products right now. It's really about our, our, the concepts of how we operate. Now in this pattern of fixtures, we've got a corridor running right here, and we've got this pattern of fixtures that's built on the walls coming in and out of all these little office cubbies that have no front door on them. So we're going corner to corner installation, in and out, in and out of every single little room. Now there's a match line from here to here, and again, we're coming in and out, in and out, then down the adjacent corridor, match line from here onto the next page. This is over 750 linear feet, all one catalog number and one price. Now, think about this. You, all the problems that you're eliminating by having us build this as a comprehensive system. See, this is important for you to understand. If you were to go out to, the, to, to a dealership, car dealership, and you want to buy a car, you don't say, okay, Mr. Dealer, I want four tires, and I want uh, some brake pads, and I want an alternator, and I want a steering wheel, and I want a, steer, you know, a, a safety belts and I want a windshield and I want a radio and then you put it all together in your garage that's not how you operate right you go to that dealer and you buy a car it's an engineered system and you trust that all the components that are built into that engineered system were designed to operate correctly in conjunction with each other in the same way that's how we operate see we're gamma lux lighting systems not gamma lux parts and pieces we think in totality see the gentleman that 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 founded the company they're engineers and they run the company. So, so having an organization that's run by engineers gives us an advantage, really, because we're dealing with very complex lighting systems. And you need people at the top of that organization who think in these engineering terms. So that's why we operate the way that we do. One part number for an entire engineered lighting system, rather than a bunch of parts and pieces, and good luck, Mr. Contractor, trying to figure out how it all goes together. Now, we do require some information from the installer, specifically the wall-to-wall -wall and corner-to-corner -corner dimensions. Because we're building these fixtures to, to fit into, those, uh, into those, uh, those little office cubbies, we need to know what is the corner-to-corner -corner dimension. So as we create our drawings, our, our shop drawings, we're going to be using the designed dimensions. But we do not build to designed dimensions because we know that these walls will not be built to design dimensions. There will be variances, and sometimes it's several inches. So this is why we require the installer uh, signature approval uh, uh, of, those factory, uh, of those field dimensions. If there are any changes, of course, they need to mark those up, send those to us. We will revise our drawings and send that out for final approval. But this is a necessary part of this type of business. We don't uh, end these fixtures with telescoping modules or, or kind of a, 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 a big uh, um, spacer or something behind the fixtures because that kind of stuff, well, while it may be practical, uh, it doesn't look good. And we want to get the second job, uh, and we don't want the aesthetics to, to keep, us from, uh, keep us from getting it. So help us, if you would, please, to, to get that information. Now, whenever possible, we're going to put all the fixtures for a particular run or pattern, we're going to put them on the same pallet. So the installing contractor doesn't have to run around from floor to floor saying, oh, well, the four-footers are up, uh, you know, up on the 13th floor, and the eight-footers uh, are on the second floor, and the hanging parts are shipping out next Tuesday. We ship everything together as a comprehensive uh, uh, pattern or, or run of fixtures because we want the installing contractor to work as quickly and, and efficiently as possible. As a matter of fact, every job that we ship ships on a custom-made pallet, every single job. We don't have standard pallets sitting around and we just throw some boxes on it uh, like we know our competitors do.
And here's why. See, if we make a 10-foot fixture and stick it on an 8-foot pallet, you know exactly what's going to happen in shipping. You're going to end up with a damaged fixture. So when we make fixtures uh, that, are, that are special length, even if we make a 4-foot fixture, we're not going to put it on a 4-foot pallet. We actually make that pallet 4 feet 4 inches. We're going to make it 2 inches longer and wider on all four sides than any carton on the pallet. So as the pallets are running, uh, as, as the shipment is, is running, run, uh, you know, going across country, it's the, it's the pallets banging together and not the cartons. This is why uh, if you talk to any of your inside salespeople, you're going to find out that you, they don't really get a whole lot of uh, uh, damage complaints on, on Gamalux shipments. And it's because of the way that we pack, the way that we operate takes a little bit extra cost to do this kind of thing. So our price per foot might be a little bit higher than our competitors, but what we're doing is we're, we're increasing value by decreasing problems. And that's very valuable. That's very important. As a consumer, I don't want problems. If I buy a refrigerator, I want it to work. I don't want to, oh, well, you know, I, I spent a little bit less money for this refrigerator, and so it's okay if it breaks down six months from now. That's not acceptable to me. So... That's why I, why I, as a consumer, make the choices that I do. So we want you to understand that we do provide additional value in the way that we operate. Now let's look, talk a little about product capabilities. We can integrate other manufacturers' components into our fixtures. In this shot here, what you see is we've actually integrated track heads into the bottom of our fixture. And those track heads were never meant to be installed into a linear lighting system. But by working with that track manufacturer, in order to, to, to meet the needs of the specifier in that space, we were able to figure out how we're going to get that track head built in as part of our fixture. Now, think about the value here. What you're doing is you're cleaning up the ceiling system, which is wonderful, right? Nobody likes a very cluttered uh, ceiling system. You're also making it uh, easier for the installing contractor because now they have one component to install instead of a bunch of parts and pieces everywhere. There's all this wiring running every place. You're also making things easier for the distributor because now they have one part number to order instead of multiple and one shipment to track instead of multiple. So you see here that everybody wins. And all it takes is a little bit of collaboration with us and that track manufacturer to ensure that everything fits together properly. Now, let's talk about recessing fixtures into walls and ceilings when we're dealing with a, with a gyp or a plaster constructed wall or ceiling. Usually, when th in those applications there, you don't want to see that flange that goes all the way around the fixture. You know, it's kind of a frame around the fixture that's you know, usually not very, uh, not very aesthetically pleasing. So you specify, or your customer will specify, a flangeless fixture. Of course, those flangeless fixtures do have a flange on it, but it's a, it's a mud flange. It gets, actually gets mudded and mudded over and then painted over so you don't see the mud flange. Well, we have the same thing as well. We have a mud flange on the side of our fixture, but we have an element that nobody else has, and that is an expansion gap. See, we build an expansion gap into the construction of our fixture, which actually separates our fixture housing from the mud flange that's being mudded over. And that separation is just about a 32nd of an inch. And by doing that, see, there, here's why. See, when the lamps in that fixture, when they come on, they're going to create some heat. Whether they're fluorescent or LED, they're going to create a little bit of heat. And that's going to heat up the housing uh, hotter than the surrounding, uh, the surrounding construction of the wall. Now, uh, any material that heats up expands. So what ends up happening is the, the housing will expand just a little bit. Once it warms up, it'll expand a little bit. Well, if we put our mud flange on the side of that housing, and then it gets mudded over and painted, when that housing expands, what happens to the, to the plaster surrounding the fixture? Eventually, it starts to crack a little bit. It doesn't happen on grand opening day of the new library downtown, right? You're there, and the architect, and the, and the mayor, and the newspapers, and everybody's patting each other on the back because the library looks so good, right? I mean, let's go have some wine and cheese and you know, enjoy the evening. But you go back maybe six months later or a year later or 18 months later because the board of directors wants to review phase one so they can, uh, they can decide what they're going to do about phase two, what elements to keep, and what they want to change. And you're walking that job site, and you see all these cracks that have started to develop around the fixtures that you've specified, that you've represented, and you're no longer proud of the work that you did. And it puts you in a very poor position because people relied on you to do good work and give them a good recommendation. So we're not going to put you in that position. We, we will include an expansion gap at the factory as part of the construction of our fixture. This is not something that, like a back box or some extra piece that the contractor has to try to figure out how to put together in the field. Now, we have this on all of our recessed G-beam fixtures, not just the three-inch wide. I just happened to be showing this because that was the photo that I had. But by doing this, we're, we're creating value not just today, but for years to come. 
because you won't have those cracks developing around the fixtures. We're in California. Our, our ground moves, which means our walls move. And so even if, the, even if the fixtures were never turned on, there is stress that happens on, within our walls, and we don't want that to be developing uh, cracks around the fixtures. So uh, again, it, it's all about quality of installation uh, for us, and it protects reputations and helps you to build your business uh, as, a, uh, as a lighting professional. Now, in this application here, uh, this is an architect's private, uh, private residence, his guest bathroom, where he's got this little half-inch reveal all the way around the mirror. So the mirror is kind of like floating in space. Okay, so there's, no, there's, a, there's a little bit of a half inch gap between the mirror and the wall itself. Now, normally we would put our mud flange on all four sides of our fixture. But if we did that, then you would, have, you would see the mud flange right here in the gap between the bottom of our fixture and the top of the mirror. Well, nobody wants to see a mud flange just sitting there, right? So now the contractor is going to have to get out his drill, drill out the rivets or undo the screws that held the mud flange in. But now when he pulls off the mud flange, the housing is exposed and it hasn't been painted. Now he's calling the factory. I need some touch-up paint or they're going to try to paint it in the field. And you have all these problems. They're going to have to cover up the holes that they created when they drilled out the mud flange. All these kind of problems. So with proper collaboration, we understand, okay, you want a gap between the fixture and the mirror, that's fine. We just won't put the mud flange on the bottom of the fixture. It's very simple. So we modify our fixtures like this all the time. What this does for you, it helps you create, pro create value within the project. It's not just about the price per foot between the Gamalux and the competitor. Now it's about how we operate in order to create value for people. And this, uh, this is a, a, a good way of doing business. Now, in an application like this, where maybe we're building fixtures into the architecture all the way around all four sides, obviously very dynamic, very wonderful, but you know what? You got to have those exact field dimensions from corner to corner. Otherwise, the fixtures won't fit. They can't be chopped down in the field. So we require field dimensions on all of our, uh, uh, all of our uh, recessed fixtures as well to ensure that, uh, that the fixtures are being built to the proper, uh, the proper length. Now, a, a side note on this is you've got to make sure proper, proper coordination with the installer. We need to get the fixtures on site before the JIP goes in. Obviously, because the fixtures are being mudded into the JIP, they're going to have to go in before the JIP. But sometimes these are little details that people, people forget. So anytime you're thinking about fixtures being mudded into the walls, mudded into the ceilings, just remember, there needs to be a little coordination call with the contractor. When does the product have to be on site? That is the key piece of information that we need here at Gamalux. Once we know when the product needs to be on site, then at least we can set a reverse timetable of when things need to happen so that we can have time to build product, when the purchase order needs to arrive, when we need the signature approvals of those, shot, of those factory drawings, so that we can do our best work and allow other people to do their best work as well. So please help us, and, and whenever possible, uh, get us at least an idea as to when the product is required on site, and as soon as possible is never a real answer. Okay, that's not. Uh, it needs to give us a date, uh, which is something we can put on a calendar and say, okay, this order has to be, uh, you know, arrive on, on site by this date. Now, here's a pattern of fixtures that's being assembled at the factory, and you can see that we've got the smooth side on the sides of those housings. Even though there's a flange here, and usually flange means that this is going to be a recessed fixture, the smooth side tells us there's something special going on, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, you can see uh, this is not 90-degree corners. These are odd uh, odd angles, maybe uh, 66 degree corners or whatnot. It looks like a bit of a uh, like an M-shaped uh, type of pattern. Uh, now we're putting the f uh, all the LEDs into the fixture. We're assembling everything at the factory. Now you notice right here that the flange actually stops, and out here there's no flange on that pattern of fixtures. And then you can see the shadow of where the flange starts up again, and then no flange. And then we have flange, no flange, flange, no flange. So what's going to be happening here is this fixture, this pattern of fixtures is actually going to be recessed where there's a flange and then suspended where there's no flange. And I'll show you that application photo in just a moment. Now, as I mentioned before, we're going through the entire process of assembling everything twice at the factory to make sure that everything fits together, looks the way that it's supposed to, because you need to know that we're handling things like light leak at the factory before we pack and ship. So there weren't any light leak air, 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 uh, issues before the order shipped, and if, they're, uh, if those issues are there after, after the product ships, then there's a variable. There's something going on at the job site that, uh, uh, that probably shouldn't be happening, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. 
All right, now here's the application shot. I'm standing on a lobby floor, and I look up, and right above me, there's the second floor walkway just above me here. And then you can see the fixtures are embedded into the ceiling above that second floor walkway. And you can see they're in the ceiling and then out, in, out, in, out. Very dynamic type of installation, beautiful, absolutely gorgeous from the outside of the building. You look in and you see this amazing thing. All right, now let's take a closer look when we go upstairs. So we're on that second floor walkway, and we can see very clearly where fixtures are coming in and out uh, of, of the ceiling condition. Now, there was a huge mistake on this job, and the mistake was improper co coordination with the installer. See, we didn't, we didn't get the information about when the product was supposed to be on site until too late. And what, what that did, once we gave our lead time, we said, okay, the product's going to be on, on site you know, August 15th or whatever it was. Well, the contractor realized, oh my gosh, we're not going to have time. Once the fixtures arrive on site, we won't have time to put them up and then build the jip and build the jip around the fixtures and then mud everything in. We've got, the client has to move in maybe you know, September 1st or whatever. So they made a decision to switch from the mud flange, which was originally specified. They wanted us to switch to the cover flange. So these fixtures were originally specified with the mud flange, but because of improper coordination, the contractor had to, had to have us switch it over to the cover flange. And here's the problem that occurred. Let's draw a straight line down the end of that run of fixtures. And you see right here, there's this anomaly, there's this kind of oddball. You see that angle right there? See, what was happening, while, while we were back at the factory building the fixtures, they decided, okay, let's go ahead and put up the jib and let's make cutouts in the jib at the same dimensions as what the fixtures are going to be because we gave them the drawings of uh, you know, what, what all those dimensions were going to be. So they thought they were going to save themselves some time by, by making cutouts in the jib to allow for the fixtures to just zip right up into, that, into those cutouts. And in theory, that works great. But you know what? Reality sometimes doesn't work the way that theory does. And in reality, maybe they did this job, you know, a little bit too late on a, on a Friday afternoon. You know, it's after beer 30 on Friday afternoon. You think they're going to be doing the best quality cuts? It's not going to happen. Or if they've got their lowest price guy because nobody else wants to do this thing and they're, you know, they're trying to, uh, you know, find somebody to blame, who knows what's going on. But the truth is they didn't cut these things properly. What ended up happening is they had to hyperextend the corner of our fixtures once they arrived on site. And now with the, with the corner of the fi fixture hyperextended, the lenses can't fit, and, this, uh, uh, and the flange that they thought was going to be uh, you know, a great solution for them now creates a new problem. Because, because it's hyperextended, the flanges don't meet. Now, there are solutions to all of these things, and eventually we got through those problems. But the point is, this kind of stuff never should be happening in the first place. With proper collaboration, when you find out, oh, oh the product has to be on site, you know, August 1st or whatever, so that they have time to build the jib around the fixtures, at least that's something we have to work with. Then we can say, oh my goodness, we got to do this and we can still make this happen. Or then we go back and say, you know what, we're not going to be able to do it in that time. Do you want to, what, let's talk about solutions. But at least we have those, those conversations as a conscientious partnership of manufacturer and representative and customer. We have those conversations because we care about people's represent, rep, uh, reputations. We care about the quality of work because that's your reputation in that ceiling and ours and the distributors and the contractors. So please, please, please help us get us the proper information up front so that we can do good work. And a lot of times that means the on-site requirement date. Now here's a pattern of fixtures. Again, there was, this is not a custom fixture. This is a four inch wide, four inch tall suspended fixture, just like that one I was just showing you a little bit ago. Uh, a four inch wide, four inch tall suspended fixture, very common stuff. There's a dozen manufacturers, maybe 17 now, manufacturers that all make the same stuff. But in this particular application, they wanted us to make this into a pattern of all these V-shaped and T-shaped uh, uh, conditions. All right, so Obviously, uh, this is something that we can do. We can do any pattern. We can do any, you know, any angles. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a problem for us. There are a couple oddball exceptions, but we can talk about those on a case-by-case -case basis. But generally speaking, if you need patterns, you need complex corners, this is certainly something we can do. So once this pattern of fixtures was created, then it was installed on the walls in the parking garage at AVA Medical Facility in Seattle to point people in the direction of where they need to go. Very nice, very clean. Now, um, uh, in the bottom of the fixtures, we provided weep holes because this is up in Seattle. There's a lot of moisture and such. So uh, uh, we, wanted, uh, uh, we wanted there to be weep holes in the bottom of the fixtures so that condensation uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't develop inside the fixtures. Uh, we can use polycarbonate lenses. 
in these fixtures because who knows about you know vandals uh, in the space and so uh, if there's a if there's a space where, uh, uh, where where it's potential for people to to you know to exercise their uh, their anger <laughs> uh, on the fixtures and, and we don't want that we can install polycarbonate lenses in these fixtures, which is vandal resistant. We can hold those polycarbonate lenses in with tamper resistant fasteners. And since the housing itself is not embedded into the, into the wall, but is actually exposed on the wall, we can put those tamper resistant fasteners through the side of the housing to hold those lenses in the sides rather than in front of the lens creating shadows. So there's always creative ways to get this kind of stuff done. And again, provide value within the project. You need to light the space anyway. Let's do something creative with a standard product, not a custom product. Let's do it with a standard product in order to create value within that project. Of course, continuous runs of fixtures. We can do this with all of our products. And we don't give you, uh, uh, you know, shadows at the end of your run because the LEDs weren't long enough and that kind of silliness. We always use the right LED components to give you consistent illumination throughout the entire pattern of fixtures. So we can do continuous runs of any length uh, past, uh, well, really uh, one foot. Uh, so uh, so uh, and it, down to fractions of an inch. And actually, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. To my knowledge, we're the only manufacturer that can make fixture housings up to 24 feet long in a single piece. Now, certainly we can do continuous runs of any length, and you saw that just now. I think those runs were 47 feet, 5 and 3 eighths, whatever it was. But to be able to do one housing up to 24 feet long, it creates a lot of value. See, from an aesthetic standpoint, well, we can, depending on the, the, the shape of that housing, if it's a tall rectangular housing, it has a lot, of, a lot of rigidity to it. We can hold that tall rectangular housing with just two cables. So you think about from an architectural or an interior design standpoint, a very long run of fixtures suspended with just two cables, quite desirable. Obviously, uh, it also helps with installation as well because now there are just uh, two suspension points instead of three, four, and sometimes five suspension points that I see on these 24-foot runs. The next time you go up and go into a, into a customer's location and you see runs of suspended fixtures, count how many cables there are across a 24-inch span, and some of you are going to count five cables, and that is just unnecessary. So. Being a manufacturer that can provide additional value within the project by eliminating the unnecessary cables gives us an advantage, even though our price per foot might be a little bit higher than the competitor. What we're providing is an aesthetic that they just can't. Also, uh, uh, rather than the distributor having to order two 12-footers or three 8-footers for that run, and then maybe there's, there's joints uh, uh, where, the, where you've got uh, wires being pinched between, in the joints between the housings, or if the joints aren't joined together properly, you've got light leaks, we eliminate all those problems. So again, creating a single-piece 24-foot housing uh, creates value within the project. Now, in an application like this, this was not our product. This just happened to be a, a, a shot that I that I took at one of the many many airports that I uh, uh, that I that I go through uh, each year. You can also see that if the joint between two housings is sagging a little bit, then you're going to get light leak at that joint. Now, it's as simple as as the contractor just raising up that joint and then tightening up the screws uh, at that joint between fixtures. But if Southwest Airlines has to move in tomorrow you're going to have to give up some things. And unfortunately, sometimes those things end up resulting in, in light leak and, and poor installations. So again, a 24-foot single-piece housing helps you to reduce and possibly eliminate those problems. Of course, how do you ship it? On a custom-made 25-foot pallet with a steel gondola holding the whole thing together so when the forks come into the center, we don't have 12, and 12 feet of fixtures uh, dangling off the ends, bending and, 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 and warping. So we're very conscientious in how we operate to ensure that the products that we make can actually be used at the job site. Now here's a detail that I don't show to many people. I, I do show it to, uh, to, our, to engineers, uh, and a couple times, uh, in, in, of course, in all my lunch presentations, I show this. But, uh, but generally speaking, I don't show it to, in, in short uh, presentations to anybody other than engineers. This is the end of a fixture that's going to be joined to another fixture in a continuous run. Okay, So this is what we call our joiner web. And uh, the way that this works is there's going to be another joiner web in the adjacent fixture that's going to be end to end with this one. And these four holes right here uh, are going to be the places where the, the, the nuts and bolts uh, are going to, to grab uh, and, and, uh, and draw that joint, uh, that joint nice and tight. Now, in order to, to add that joiner web into the end of our fixture, we've got to screw it on. 
And so when we design our housings, we design them with these screw bosses that run the entire length of the housing so that wherever we happen to cut this housing, uh, that screw boss will be, uh, will be available to us at, at the exact same position, regardless of the length of the housing. So in order to screw things on, you know how it goes with screws, right? Righty tighty, lefty loosey. That's how you put a screw on. Well, if you've ever t uh, tried to maybe screw two small pieces of wood together, right when that, when that screw sort, sort of bites its way into the second, uh, the second piece of wood, the first piece of wood wants to start to twist. And so then you have to jig it up and you've got to hold everything nice and tight in order to, in order to get that done. Well, the reason why that happens is because of friction. So when, when, you've got, when you've got screws that are tightening something down onto another component, you're creating this friction, which actually creates a bit of a torque in that housing. And what, you're at, what you end up doing is you, you end up deforming. Not, well, it's, it's not really like a, a visible deformation or a bend or a bow or anything like that, but there's a little bit of a twisting desire, if you will, a torque at the end of that fixture. Well, when you've got that torque, uh, or, uh, um, uh, putting all that pressure uh, on the end of the fixture, then you've got multiple fixtures in a continuous run. Eventually, that pressure starts to build up. And what I see, the, the end result of that is a twist in continuous runs of fixtures. And I see this kind of stuff all the time. I go through these airports, and of course, I'm, I'm looking for these, these errors because I know that you know, if something is not our product, I can see it very clearly uh, up, uh, you know, up in the ceiling. And I, and I look from one end of that continuous run. It's you know, 80 feet long or whatever. I look from one end down to the other end, and I see this subtle twist all the way down that run. And I know exactly what happened on installation day. That's when all the finger pointing happened. See, the contractor is blaming the distributor because, you know, and the distributor is blaming, blaming you and, and, and the specifier is blaming everybody. And, 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 and you know, it's, it's just, you know, it, it's a big blame fest, right? And we get really good at that kind of stuff in our careers. We get really good at blaming others because, you know, we don't want to take the responsibility for, for, for the problem. But the reality is it's physics that's responsible for this problem because, you can't do anything about that torque unless you build fixtures the way that we do. We use left turn and right turn screws to put our, cr our cross webs onto the ends of our fixtures. And by doing that, what we're doing is we're, we're neutralizing that twisting force in the end of our fixture so that when multiple fixtures are joined end to end, we don't have that twisting uh, uh, condition happening. Now, the installing contractor does not know anything about these four screws. We're going to paint over those four screws at the factory, and this is not something they have to do, to get, do in the field. There's no way that they're going to be able to do this. You know, they're just going to be trying to tighten this thing up, and it's never going to go in. Or they try to remove this one, and it's never going to happen. So, uh, so, so this is not something the installing contractor ever, ever has to work with. Uh, we paint over those screws, and they're just going to be using four nuts and bolts right here in those holes to join housings together. But we do this because we don't want you to be the bad guy on the job. And we don't want to be the bad guy. And we don't want the distributor to be the bad guy or the contractor or the specifier or anybody to be the bad guy. This is why we operate the way that we do. That's why we use the components that we do to ensure that these runs of fixtures are straight. And you need to understand that about the manufacturer that you represent. And you should feel proud of that. You should be proud that you've got a manufacturer standing behind you who says, not only are we going to fix problems if they come up, we're going to avoid those problems from even happening in the first place. We're going to create value by eliminating the problems. All right. Now, here's an application where an architect wanted to have a 12-foot long, fi uh, long fixture, but only eight feet of that fixture recessed into the ceiling, and they wanted the last four feet of that fixture suspended out in open space to provide bi-directional illumination down, of course, to illuminate the floor, and then also up to illuminate this upper ceiling. And then just for kicks, they wanted no cable support at the end of the fixture. Now, if you think that this is easy to do. It is not easy to do. There's a lot of complexity involved in this kind of thing. But we've learned as we go. We get better with every job, right? And that's, uh, uh, of course, that's, that's to your benefit. Now, what we did here is rather than you building five custom fixtures, which would absolutely bust the budget, what we did is we, what we, did is we took a 12-foot long suspended fixture that every manufacturer has, four inches wide, five inches tall, very common type of stuff, we took that 12-foot long suspended fixture and we modified eight feet of it with our mud flange, where we put mud flange on the bottom of that fixture across eight feet of the 12-foot housing. In the upper portion of the fixture, we removed the upper lamp. This is a fluorescent job we did like 10 years ago, um, maybe longer. But uh, it's, just, it's, a, it's a good example of, of these, uh, these concepts. Um, 
and rather than having a, a lamp in the top of that eight foot section of the fixture, we added a mounting plate that we coordinated with the installing contractor before we started building the fixtures. This is very important. See, if, if, if the contractor opens up the fixtures and that's the very first time that he's seeing these components, he doesn't know what to do. And that's one of the reasons why he doesn't like you and doesn't like the distributor and doesn't like all the manufacturers and doesn't like the designer because nobody really gives this guy the opportunity to weigh in on how the, fact, how the fixtures are really supposed to be built. He's the last guy at the, at the bottom of the totem pole, and yet everybody's requiring him to do his very best work. Now think about this, the, the, the insanity of that, of that concept. You've got the guy who had to be the low bidder, right, because the high bidder doesn't get the job, right? It's the low bidder that gets the job. So this is the guy that had to be the low bidder, and everybody's expecting him to do the work of the high bidder, which makes zero sense because he doesn't have the resources of the high bidder. He's not paying his guys top dollar. That's why he's the low bidder. So now you've got people out in the field that are not as, nearly as qualified as the high bidder, and we're all asking them to do this amazing, amazing work. That's why they don't like anybody. That's why they fight about every little change. That's why they fight about every little uh, 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 opportunity to, 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 to come in with a change order because they need to make up the money from being the low bidder. So rather than playing that game, what we want to do is we want to give that contractor who wants to do good work. This is a craftsman. He got into his business because he wants to do good work. But somewhere along the line, he became the low bidder. Let's help him. What we're going to do is we're going to ask him, Mr. Con before we start building fixtures, Mr. Contractor, what kind of mounting components are going to make sense for you? Do you want to use a bracket? Do you want to use a, a threaded rod? Do you want to use building wire? Do you want us to, to build some kind of a clamp because there's a pipe running directly above the fixtures? What do you need from us so that we can help you do your best quality work? And now he becomes a designer. You see, and that creates a lot of pride for him. So that when, maybe 10 years, 15 years down, you know, uh, later, he's, he's driving around, uh, downtown and, and, and he's, he's got his kids or his mom in the car or says, and he points up and says, hey, you see those fixtures through the window right there? I designed those. Those were mine. And okay, fine. He's not the specifier. Let's let him believe that he's the designer because in reality, he designed the mechanism that was necessary so that, so that everybody wins. And we want to put him in that position. We want to give him the opportunity to be proud of the work that he does. By doing that, we create a partner. We create an ally instead of an adversary. So this is why we want to collaborate with these installers before we start building fixtures on these very special applications. So uh, he finally told us what kind of mounting plate he wants to use on the fixture, and that's fine. So that's what we built. In the last four, four feet of that fixture, we left it unchanged so that we could take what used to be a suspended 12-foot fixture with now a mud flange on the bottom of the fixture and a mounting bracket that the contractor has, de has designed and, and, and we built for him so that we can take eight feet of that 12-foot fixture, embed it into the lower ceiling with the last four feet, cantilevered out, providing uh, indirect illumination to illuminate that, that, uh, that wood ceiling or the, the wood, uh, wood colored panels above. And because of the rigidity of the housing material that we're using, we don't need the cable support from above. Creating value within the project. It's not about, oh, let's buy some fixtures and let's illuminate the space. That's fine. That's very whole hum and that's your cookie cutter kind of approach. But when you're dealing with creative people, specifiers, who want to create a reputation for themselves and carve out a niche within, within their profession and, and, and have people look to them for their expertise, this is how you get it done, by giving them the opportunities to do creative things, to build that reputation, to build that name for themselves. And when you are the person that helped them do that, you're getting the next job. You're not going to get every single job, obviously, but once they've got that hunger to do creative things and to, and to do it in, a, in, a, in an effective way that doesn't alienate everybody else along the way, the tri distributor and the contractor, by doing that, they, became, they become the kind of person that people want to work with. And that's why we operate the way that we do. We're trying to build partnerships, build friendships, build allies. Even though our product looks the same as everybody else, what you can do with it is quite different than what everybody else will offer. Now, remember that architect with the bathroom mirror? Here's his kitchen. He's got this eight-foot countertop, and he's got the fixture centered directly above the eight-foot countertop. So there's uh, five feet exposed and only three feet in the ceiling. He didn't want to rebuild the ceiling uh, to, to allow you know, for, the, for more of the fixture to be recessed. Now, because there's only three feet in the ceiling and five feet exposed, we needed the support cable from above, obviously, because there's so much pressure on the ceiling. But if it was the other way around, if it's eight feet in the ceiling and four feet exposed or three feet exposed or two feet exposed, we don't need the support cable. So it just depends on what's going on in the space. We'll determine whether or not we need that support cable. 
All right, now here's a recessed application where, as actually right above my head, I'm in the conference room at Gamalux, and this is where we are. So uh, uh, the, uh, we've got a pattern of fixtures that's actually separating two different ceiling systems. We've got JIP out here. This is the wall right here. Okay? And then we've got the JIP right here. But in here, we have grid, not JIP. Well, normally when you see these, these, uh, these multi-condition ceiling systems, um, it's the contractor that has to try to figure out how to interface between the JIP and the grid. And sometimes it doesn't work out so well, and the lines aren't perfectly straight. But when you let the fixture create that delineation, you're going to end up with a solution that actually works and works quite well. So we will put our mud flange on the outside of that pattern of fixtures to interface with the, with the jib ceiling, and then we'll put a different flange on the inside of the fixture to interface with the grid ceiling. Now in this particular case, the grid ceiling was raised up two inches above the bottom of the fixture, but it could have been flush with the bottom of the fixture if you want, or three inches above, or half an inch, it doesn't matter. And we can do uh, recessed on both sides, or recessed on one side, or, or, or whatever. Two different ceiling heights, it doesn't matter. See, we can put our flanges wherever we want on the sides of our, actually wherever you and your customer want, on the sides of the fixture. And by doing that, you're creating character in that ceiling line. It's not just about, okay, here's a flat ceiling and here's some light fixtures. Let the ceiling become part of the design of the space and let the fixture create the delineation between those two different ceiling systems. Again, creating value within the project. I can't stress this enough. Once you figure out how to let Gamalux create value within a project, you're going to be much more, well, not competitive, you'll win. I don't want to be competitive, I want to win. And so that's why we operate the way that we do, to let you win but it requires proper collaboration and, and, and obviously a lot of work on your part as well. But when you're doing that work and getting paid for it at the end and building reputations and friendships and allies along the way, that's the kind of career that you want. And that's, that's certainly the case for me. All right, so here's a pattern of fixtures. We're coming up the wall and across the ceiling, and then we turn to 90 degrees down the ceiling, and it's going down the hallway or whatever. Very common kind of stuff. And so, yes, we can do this kind of stuff. And you saw earlier, we're not just bound to 90s and 45-degree corners. We can do 33, 66, 22 hike. It doesn't matter, you know, what the, what the, what the patterns, uh, what the corners are. Um, uh, we, we, we can build it. We can interface with any kind of ceiling system, even if it's a ceiling system we've never even heard of before. As long as we can get the technical information on that ceiling system, we will figure out the right way to interface. And yes, it does require a little bit of work, but maybe it's just as much work as giving us the phone call, uh, the phone number to the, to the engineer on the job or, or, the, or the ceiling contractor or whoever, um, uh, so that we can get the right information about that ceiling system so that we can provide uh, the, the correct components to allow the fixtures to interface with the wood ceiling or metal ceiling or jip or fabric or foam or pixie dust. It doesn't matter. As long as we can find out what it is, we'll figure out how to interface with it. Now, here's an application where we've, the architect wanted to create steps in the ceiling. You see that, that the fixtures are kind of coming up to, to a point right here, and then they're coming back down on the other side. Well, if you think about a step ceiling, there's a lot of complexity. There's all kind of potential problems and, and a lot of players involved in this kind of stuff, a lot of decision makers on this, on this kind of stuff. And so um, what we wanted to do is eliminate a lot of the potential problems by taking a little bit, taking control or, or at least offering our resources to take control. So what we did is we, we controlled the, the, uh, um, uh, the differential in the ceiling heights at the factory, which is, and this is the way we did it. We found out what the ceiling system was. It was the Armstrong Axiom ceiling system, which uses an extruded aluminum channel that gets installed onto the walls in the space. And then, and then the grid kind of drops into that channel, and then, and then the grid slides across that channel to wherever it's supposed to go, and then they drop in the tiles into the, into the grid. So what we did is we got a hold of that, that channel called the vector trim, and we attached that extruded channel, is an Armstrong vector, we, we attached it at the sides of our fixture at two different heights at the factory, at our factory. We cut everything to the same lengths. We painted it all with the same paint so that when the fixtures arrive on site, it looks like it's, it was truly engineered to be that way in the first place. Now, of course, this was not our choice to, to create a one-inch differential. It was the architect's choice. But once we, once we knew that, then we realized, okay, let's just put that, that wall trim, that Armstrong wall trim on the sides of our fixture at one-inch height differences. And by doing that, now it allows the installing contractor to just snap his grid right into the sides of our housing slide that grid along that channel wherever it's supposed to go, and then drop in the ceiling tiles. So he's using the components that he's already familiar with. 
So we eliminate a lot of potential problems by letting them use the components that they already know. Now, everything was independently supported. The, the grid was port, supported independently of the fixtures, and they're just tying together uh, uh, laterally rather than one resting on the other. So, uh, so it doesn't cause any problems with, with, uh, with code uh, or anything like that. Now, this is one of my favorite examples of, of all of our capabilities. This is a single piece, 18 foot housing going from fully recessed with flanges down low to carry the cut tiles to semi-recessed with flanges up high to carry the cut tiles. And you can see the flange right here at the end of the fixture, carrying, which carries the cut tiles. Now, uh, uh, the, you'll notice, again, we're using a, a suspended fixture with the smooth sides, and we've modified this so that it could be recessed. Now, this trim detail, the designer on this job wanted that trim detail to butt right up against the side of our fixture. And so this was a lot of kind of like puzzle pieces that had to fit together. Well, since we have a, a trim on the top of our fixture and a trim on the bottom of our fixture, the trim on the bottom of the fixture had to be modified, had to be cut back by three-quarters of an inch to allow that trim piece to butt right up against the side of our fixture. Now, there's, there's an anomaly here, and that is, see this little angle right there? Those trims cut across our fixture at a three degree angle. And this means that the flanges on the bottom of the fixture have to be cut at two different lengths. The flanges on the top of our fixture have to be cut at two different lengths, and with a three degree cut, at the ends of those flanges with a three-quarter inch setback between the upper flange and the lower flange. And because this is happening at an angle, it occurs at a different location in every single fixture all the way down this side of the room, all the way down the left side of the room on six floors. This is all one type on the fixture schedule, but no two fixtures were identical. And it was because of the shape of the building. The designer wanted all the fixtures to be kind of be perp perpendicular uh, to, the, to the sides of the building like, uh, like spines or something, or you know, ribs. Okay? But it's in the attention to detail. The installing contractor told the designer she's nuts, right? The contractor just wanted her to do an eight-foot fixture here, do an eight-foot fixture over here and separate it and not have any of this uh, mumbo-jumbo here in the middle. But a designer who's trying to create a reputation for herself and trying to build her, her, her business and, and, and increase her skills knows that you've got to do creative things in order to do that. So she said, no, 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 I want, I want consistency between the lower ceiling and the upper ceiling. And that meant one single piece housing with all the trims cut at exactly the proper locations. We cut those flanges down to 256 of an inch at the factory at exactly the right position so they can interface with that, with that, uh, uh, that diagonal trim exactly where it was supposed to go. Now, at the end of that job, that contractor went back to the lighting designer and said, oh my gosh, you were right. We had no idea some manufacturer could hold these kind of tolerances because we'd never really done any business in that part of the country before. They didn't know Gamalux. We, to them, they, we just looked like another linear manufacturer, right? And so they, there was nothing special to them. But now they understood, oh boy, these guys are in the attention to detail. Now, obviously not every job requires that kind of thing, but if you're dealing with somebody that wants to get themselves up on the stage at the IES show or the, the AIA show and get an award, we're the manufacturer to go with. Now, it doesn't mean we can get you awards on every single job. Obviously, that, uh, nobody can do that. But what I can say is if you're willing to, to put in the time to collaborate properly with creative people that are trying to create good reputations for themselves and do the kind of unusual and, and dynamic things that are going to draw people's attention to their work, then we want that kind of business. That's how we grow. That's how we build partnerships. And frankly, it gives us something proud to, you know, we can be proud of this kind of stuff. We get to take the photos and put them up on our website and tell wonderful stories about how this stuff you know, actually worked out. And yeah, there's a lot of collaboration. Gosh, we had months of, of conference calls leading up to, to the time that we actually had to start building fixtures. But it's for the purpose of finding out exactly what needs to be built to create value within the project. You have to light the space anyway. Why not do it in a creative way that actually draws attention to good quality work and raises the standard for other manufacturers? I think that's a good way of doing things. Here's an application uh, uh, in the Armstrong, I'm sorry, I apologize, the, the Hunter Douglas textile ceiling, where the, the panels, you notice that this, there are no grids. Uh, even though there's a grid ceiling just above these panels, the panels actually snap onto the grid from below. And when, the, when two panels snap onto the grid, they underlap the grid. So there's a cool little quarter inch gap between the panels, even though the grid directly above that, that gap is a one-inch grid, or actually 15 sixteenths. So <clears throat> what we did is we, uh, we, we built our fixture uh, with, a, uh, with, an, with an expanded bottom. Uh, the bottom of the fixture is wider than the top, so that when the fixtures are installed up into the grid from below, 
that expanded bottom of our fixture butts up against the bottom of the grid and allows for the bottom of the fixture to be at the same plane as the bottom of those panels, one, one and one-eighth inch uh, uh, down from the bottom of the grid. Also, because we've expanded the bottom of our fixture, it now can, it creates consistency uh, uh, of that quarter-inch gap between the side of the fixture and the side of the adjacent panels. So uh, this would have been a custom fixture, absolutely, because, because it's, a, it's a whole new uh, extrusion. But now that we've had this for, I guess, six or seven years, um, it's no longer custom for us. It's just a standard product. But once in a while, we will make a custom fixture because we see the potential to partner with other manufacturers or because your job is so large and there's going to be so much value to it, uh, it's okay to, for us to go ahead uh, and, and, and go through the expense of making a custom fixture. But most of the time, we'll just modify a standard. This is the Armstrong Tech Zone, and again, uh, similar concept, continuous runs uh, in the zone. Uh, um, and we, we can uh, integrate with either the 6-inch zone or even the 4-inch, uh, the Armstrong 4-inch uh, zone without the need for the, for the yoke that joins those grids, uh, typically joins those grids together uh, above, up, up above the ceiling line. Because our housing is so rigid, it actually eliminates the need to... Uh, um, to, uh, to use that yoke, and we've got brackets along the side of our fixture that actually keep the grid straight. So it's a very nice, uh, nice uh, extruded product. Extruded. All of our housings are extruded aluminum, and this is one of the reasons why, because they're always uh, quite straight. This is the uh, Hunter Douglas box series ceiling system. It's a metal uh, ceiling system where the panels are, are uh, nominally uh, uh, three inches or, or, or six inches. Uh, I'm sorry, four inches or six inches. It's actually, it's actually center to center uh, dimension of four inches or six inches. So the panels themselves are a little bit less than that. But what we did here is we made our fixture the same width as the panels. And then we've got a joiner spline at the end of our fixture to interface with the cut panel in line with our fixture so that you go panel, panel, fixture, panel, 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 fixture, on and on and on. So you get consistency in the ceiling system because the panels and the fixtures are exactly the same width. And we have joiner mechanism to hold everything nice and tight together. As a matter of fact, we worked out our joiner mechanism with Hunter Douglas themselves to ensure that, that, the, that the joiner bracket that slides along the side of our fixture can, can interface properly with their universal carrier that holds their ceiling system together. So even though the universal carrier is being cut to allow for our fixture to fit into the space, the strength of these brackets actually holds the ceiling back together just as rigid, just as rigid as if uh, as rigidly as if the fixture was never even there. We've got to avoid this kind of stuff. These one size fits all solutions. We don't do one size fits all because one size only fits one, and the rest are compromises. But this is what people have, have become accustomed with, uh, accustomed to, and, and and somehow it's become acceptable. And I don't find that to be that it's not acceptable. Uh, to, to have an installation like this just because uh, somebody had to save some money, you know, a couple bucks per, per foot with the fixtures or, or maybe the original manufacturer wasn't able to ship in time and so you had to find an alternate and yeah, they can ship it in time, but good luck. This is, you know, this is the aesthetic that you get. So help us. Collaborate with us. Let us know when the product has to be on site so we can get good quality product out to the job site and you don't have to apologize for this kind of thing. Integrating fixtures into a space. Now, here we have uh, linear air diffusers that have been uh, built into this, into this theater. And again, the designer wanted uh, consistency throughout the space. So, so building fixtures in conjunction with the linear air diffusers so you have that consistency and just an absolutely beautiful uh, installation with some fixtures uh, recessed uh, and some uh, semi-recessed uh, throughout the space. Uh, continuous runs of fixtures. Again, not going to talk about the, the LEDs, but now the lenses. You see, remember what, we, what I was talking about with the housings, how when they heat up, they expand. Well, the same is truth for lenses. When lenses heat up, they're going to expand. So if you specify or you order a 40-foot run of fixtures, we're not going to give you 40 feet of lenses because when that lens expands, it could actually, pardon me, uh, when the lens expands, it could actually push the end caps off the fixture. And then you've got gaps and you've got light leaks and all kinds of problems. So we don't operate that way. We're going to cut the lenses short intentionally a little bit shorter than normal, so that when they expand, the little gap between the lenses goes away. Now, it's quite possible that at the end of a job, there may be some residual gaps because we don't know the exact ex ambient temperature of what, you know, what the space is going to be, and, and it could fluctuate. And it certainly, if, you know, it, 
if the fixtures are being installed and, and the heating or the, the air conditioning hasn't been installed in the space yet, you're going to have all kinds of inconsistent gaps. And so uh, you can't really judge the gaps until the, the, the HVAC system is operational. And then you know what the real ambient temperature is going to be in the space, and then you can judge uh, whether there are any residual gaps in the lenses. But if there are, this is where our integrity comes in. You see, we answer the phone. We're going to ask questions. We want to understand what's happening in the space so that we can come up with a good solution. And this, again, is, is, is how, to, how integrity is a very important part of how we operate. The truth is, something's, uh, on big jobs, something's going to go wrong. We know something's going to go wrong. Whether it's our fault, your fault, their fault, that's, that doesn't matter. Eventually, obviously, you've got to deal with the, that kind of stuff to figure out who's going to pay for it. But we, at least we want to jump in right away and provide a solution. And that's the kind of manufacturer we want to be, to be responsive and, and get you the solutions that you need. Because you can't leave a job with this kind of problem. Lenses have expanded and pushed end caps off of fixtures. And, oh, well, that's what you ordered. Good luck. Well, the spec sheet said that the, you know, the lenses will expand and might push. That's silliness. We're going to solve that kind of problem. This was not our product, by the way. We don't do three cables within the span of two feet. But, uh, uh, but uh, you'd be surprised at how many, how many specifier offices, even, even architect's offices, I walk into and I take these photos uh, when nobody's looking uh, to, to, to <laughs> as an example of, of, of what could go wrong with, uh, with some, of our, uh, some of our competitors. We can't have this kind of thing. Lenses bowing, lenses warping, snapping themselves out of fixtures because they had no place to expand to. This is not the kind of thing that we leave with people. We don't want, that's not the kind of reputation that we want to have. So, uh, uh, so we do cut our lenses short intentionally to allow them to expand. At the end of that job, if there are any residual gaps, just have the contractor measure the last gap, uh, uh, you know, measure the, the gaps, and we'll give instructions on how to do this. We'll replace one of the lenses to take up all the, all, all the gaps. Um, <clears throat> Now, if you run lighting calculations or if you're dealing with people that, that, that do, uh, you'll find that, that it sometimes takes, it takes quite a while to get these calculations run because of inaccurate or insufficient information provided by the manufacturer. We don't provide insufficient information. We provide more information than you need uh, because we want you to be able to, to find the info that, that, that you've got to have. So we provide uh, what we call a, a lumens per foot delivered chart on page two of all of our LED spec sheets. And that chart shows the lumens per foot that you would get at either standard output or high output uh, the two the two standard options that we have on our web uh, on our spec sheets with either a medium diffuse lens or a heavy diffuse lens in any one of the five color temperatures that we offer in that fixture so that you can make accurate uh, uh, calculations to determine the uh, the output and, and the, the performance of the fixtures but we don't just provide the performance numbers in our specification sheet we actually show you what that lens uh, in uh, that you've selected what that lens is going to look like inside the fixture with the LEDs turned on you see, this is very important. Not all manufacturers, as a matter of fact, I don't know of any other manufacturer that does this, where they show the fixture directly below linear lighting systems shooting that camera straight through the lens with the LEDs illuminated behind it. See, everybody's got the glamour shot, right? The, the photo is a, 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 of the fixture in its, in its most wonderful condition, but nobody shows you what that product is going to look like when you're sitting in your chair looking straight up at that fixture and scrutinizing it. We do. Because we don't want people just to fall in love with the performance of the fixture and not understand about the aesthetics. So in our specification sheet, right next to the performance of the fixture, that's where we show that photo of the, of the heavy diffuse lens or the medium diffuse lens with the LEDs fully illuminated behind it. Directly next to that image, there's the hot link to the IS file. So you don't have to go, to, go back to our website and find the zip file with all the IS files and play catalog number bingo trying to figure out which one is the right file. We provide all that information uh, right there on our spec sheet, as well as not just the IS file, but also the Revit file as well, so that people who are working with Revit, again, they can get those files as quickly as possible. We offer multiple widths of fixtures from anywhere from inch and a half up to 10 inches wide in our fixtures with consistency throughout, consistency in the aesthetic. We don't have some, you know, some types of lenses only available in this kind of fixture, but not in that kind of fixture. So if you wanted the three, two different or three different widths of fixtures, you get different aesthetics. That's silly. So we provide the same uh, aesthetic in all of our fixture widths. In addition to flat lenses, we also do uh, three-dimensional lenses. And we are offering these three-dimensional lenses in our one-and-a-half-inch one wide, two-inch, three-inch, and four-inch wide G-beam fixtures. So quite a wide variety of fixtures now with the three-dimensional lens option in the bottom or also the top. And, of course, recessed fixtures as well in all those same, uh, those same widths. 
In addition to an exposed three-dimensional lens, we also do regressed lenses as well. Now, because of the way that we make our fixtures, we can actually adjust that regress to basically whatever, whatever dimension you want. So if you want it only regressed half an inch, we can do that. If you want it regressed five inches, we can do that. By modifying the fixture itself, we can then create a five-inch regress if that's what you wanted uh, or, or what your customer wanted in the space. In suspended fixtures, surface-mounted, recessed, you name it. So a lot of variety uh, that's available to you. Da we'll do damp location. We cannot do wet location. There are only a couple things that we don't do. Right now, we don't do wet location and we don't do curved fixtures. But if you need damp location in any of our, uh, any of our products, we can do that. Wall washing is a very important part of good lighting design. Obviously, if you've got an object wall, and it's because something is important happening on that wall. There's a photo, or there's a trophy case, or the company logo for your client is on that wall, and so we want to illuminate that properly. And so wall washing is a very important uh, part of that, uh, of that, uh, that type of uh, situation. Now, there are competitors that offer wall wash fixtures. I find them to be insufficient. Uh, many of these wall wash fixtures, yes, it, it, it washes the wall the way that it's supposed to, but golly, it's bound by the grid. It's got all these, these ugly components inside that draw attention to themselves. Uh, if there's a shadow up at the top of the wall, it can't provide consistent illumination from side to side. You name it. There's all kinds of problems with a lot of our competitors' wall wash fixtures. So we solve those problems with our version of the wall washer. We can build our fixture in any length down to 256 of an inch so you can get that wall wall-to-wall -wall, uh, um, installation that, uh, that, that a lot of people like. Because of the kick reflector that kicks down below from the bottom of our fixture, we're actually projecting light onto the wall to illuminate it properly. And the second thing the kick reflector does for you, it keeps you who's in the room from looking up inside the fixture. So it acts as a glare shield as well. What this does is it quiets the ceiling and allows the wall to, to take priority. So that's why we build our wall washer the way that we do, so that you don't see inside the fixture, and we project light onto that wall and even eliminate the shadows at the top of the wall because of that drop-down kick reflector. Now, some folks re do, do object to that kick reflector in the bottom of the fixture. Okay, well, here's, here's, your, here's your wall wash with, with no kick reflector in the bottom of the fixture. You're going to have a shadow at the top of the wall, and if you're going with the cheap stuff that, that can't be built to continuous runs, it's going to be broken up by the grid too. But that's just not the kind of product we offer. So our, our fixture does have a kick reflector, kick reflector on the bottom to illuminate all the way to the top of your object wall, to eliminate those inconsistencies, and we can build it in any length to, to accommodate the, uh, the construction of that space and even fully illuminated corners. So creating a lot of value within the project with our wall wash fixture. Next, we'll move into perimeter lighting systems. And here, uh, in the world of perimeter lighting systems, there are all kinds of things that can go wrong. One of the big problems with perimeter lighting systems is because they have to be installed up in the ceiling around the perimeter of the space. The perimeter of the space is rarely perfectly straight. You see, because a constructed wall is never actually perfectly straight. But the fixture, because it's made of metal in a factory, the fixture is straight. So what most manufacturers do is they'll set the fixture off the wall intentionally by creating some kind of a bracket system on, this, on the back of the fixture that separates the fixture from the wall. Because the wall's not perfectly straight, they would never want to put their fixture directly up against the wall because then there will be these inconsistent gaps at various places all along that wall. So by separating the fixture from the wall itself, we, they create this, this intentional gap, but the problem is it's often inconsistent. In some places, it's only a half inch, and maybe just four feet away, it's, it's creeped up to an inch deep, uh, and, and you get all this inconsistency. And there's no designer. You'll never talk to an architect that says, oh yeah, I love how there's a gap between the back of the fixture and the wall. Right in the only place where I can actually see the fixture, I'm seeing this inconsistent gap running the entire 40-foot length, 40 length down that corridor. I love that. Give me more of that gap. Nobody ever says that. But they always put up with it because they don't have a good solution. We came up with a good solution. We took 18 months to develop our, 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 uh, our perimeter lighting system. And the primary element of our perimeter lighting system is giving it the ability to interface with the wall itself. See, we've, added, we've created a mud flange that gets installed onto the unfinished wall just above the ceiling line. Here's the ceiling line right here. So this mud flange gets screwed to the wall, and then there are these little mud ribs in the bottom of that flange that get mudded over. So, so now, uh, after that wall has been mudded over and painted, when our reflector 
snaps into our mud flange, it looks like the reflector is actually diving into the wall. Here's how it works. We've got this unfinished wall with all these sections of drywall, and they've got the, the, uh, um, the sections of uh, uh, the joints all covered up with the fiberglass tape and the skim coat of plaster. Well, that, that fiberglass tape and skim coat of plaster actually creates a little bit of a thickness on the wall, kind of like a mountaintop. And if you've got a mountaintop, then that means you're going to have a valley on each side of it. And so when our plaster trim or our mud flange is installed onto that unfinished wall, it's going to, uh, it's going to butt right here up against that high point, which means that it's going to have little gaps adjacent to that high point. But we don't care about those gaps. The inconsistencies are going to go away. Because once we've installed, or once this piece has been installed onto the wall, you see these little mud ribs? Well, those mud ribs are there to receive the bead of fiberglass tape all the way across, and then a skim coat of plaster to be brought down the wall. Now, that skim coat of plaster is going to be smoothed over, and then the wall will be textured and finished per the architectural instructions, whatever it happens to be. Now, now the, the, the exposed portion of our trim has this little groove in it. You see that shadow? That's a little groove, and that groove is there to receive the reflector assembly from our fixture, which snaps into that little groove eliminating the gap between the back of the fixture and the wall and allowing the reflector to become part of the wall. It's the most visible part of the fixture. It should be the most attractive. And that's why we build it this way. Now, as I say, that reflector snaps into a little groove when the groove is, is, is mudded over into the space. And that's great if you've got a plaster or a drywall constructed wall. But if you, what if your wall isn't plaster or drywall? What if, what if the wall is brick? or stone, or glass, or metal, or, or, or wood, you, you're not going to mud over any of those materials, and so you end up with a new problem that you can't mud over. Well, notice, see the screw head right here, the groove that we use? See this guy up here, sitting there doing nothing? We made our mud flange with an additional component on the top of it so that this mud flange can actually be flipped up, it's upside down in the field, and now the component that used to be at the top is now at the bottom, and the mud ribs are up here, they're facing up, and not going to have anything to do with the reflector that now snaps into the flange that's been flipped upside down in the field for a non-mud application. This is all the same part number, and the same component that builds that, that ships with the with the fixture can just be flipped upside down for a non-mud application. Now, if there's anything that needs to go on the wall, like uh, wood paneling or tile or a mirror or anything like that, that component can just be butted right up against the the bottom of our uh, of our wall flange. Uh, and it's only a, a, about a quarter inch uh, wide, so there's not going to be a big uh, shadow or anything. But all this is happening just above the ceiling line. So it's very difficult for, them, for, for anybody in the room to see this inconsistency because they're not really looking at that. It's, a, it's actually above the ceiling line. Now, for, as far as illumination goes, we offer two types of illumination with our perimeter lighting system. We offer what we call grazing illumination, where we're shooting light straight down the wall. And then we also offer ambient illumination, where we're bouncing light back out into the space. In the grazing illumination, shooting light down the wall, of course, you're going to create shadows. And even the most shallow texture, you're going to create shadows, which is wonderful. Now, the way we do that is we use a semi-specular aluminum reflector in a parabolic shape up inside the fixture. And because it's a parabolic shape, light bounces down that parabola uh, down the wall. And here's how it works. We've got this parabolic shaped semi-specular aluminum reflector, and we've got this V-shaped lamp barrier right here. Now this V-shaped lamp barrier is reflective. So as light from the LEDs or the fluorescent lamps hits it, that light is bounced up into the main reflector, so it could be the, then be shot straight down the wall. And that's why you get this nice tight candle power, candle power curve shooting light straight down the wall. Now notice the height of that lamp barrier, the cutoff angle, is right here. So even if you did have a mirror or shiny material on the wall, you'll never see the reflection of the LEDs or the fluorescent lamps in the mirror or the shiny tile on the wall because of the presence of that lamp barrier. Now that fixture is so effective that it's actually going to highlight every imperfection in the wall. So we recommend you do not use our grazing optic unless the wall, if it's a flat wall, unless it's a level 5 finish. Because if not, you're going to highlight every dimple and pimple on that wall, and that is not something that you want. <clears throat> Obviously, if there's tile or brick or stone or, or any kind of textured material, yes, you're going to get all those beautiful shadows, but this is not something that you want. You do not want to accidentally highlight the imperfections of a wall. So in that case, 
if the wall is flat and it's not a level 5 finish, we recommend you use the ambient illumination option. Now the ambient illumination option actually uses the reflector, uh, uses the wall as a reflective surface to bounce light back out into the space. Here's how it works. Rather than using a semi-specular aluminum reflector, we use a white reflector in that fixture. And because it's white material, it's more diffuse. So more light uh, uh, bounces off that material in various angles. That means that there's going to be more light hitting the top of the wall in the ambient reflector than there is with the grazing. That's why it's brighter here than it is here, even though this is closer to the camera. So this is proof that more light is bouncing off the top of the wall uh, with the ambient reflector than with the grazing. Now, that ambient reflector is also in a parabolic shape, so yes, you're going to get a lot of light that's being shot down the wall, but because of the diffuse nature of that reflector, we're, we're going to allow more light to hit the top of the wall, and that's represented here. Also, because we eliminate the lamp barrier, we're allowing a direct spike of light onto the top of the wall. So depending on the reflectivity of the wall, that's going to be determined uh, how much light will come back out into the space. Now, what I failed to show you previously is the grazing illumination is almost 65% efficient. Now, 65% is not high efficiency, except in, in, in cases where you're completely hiding the LEDs from, uh, from, from view at all. See, by hiding those LEDs, even in the reflection of a mirror or, gla uh, 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 or shiny tile, we, we, we had to come up with a way to increase the, the efficiency of the fixture. And so we use very high quality materials behind the LEDs to drive light out and down. And that's why we're able to get uh, relatively high efficiency with our grazing optic. As a matter of fact, it's higher uh, than the next competitor, uh, the next closest competitor that makes a, a six inch wide uh, fixture with a lamp barrier like, like our grazing option. The next closest competitor is light control wall slot 2000. It's 42% efficient. Ours is almost 65. So we're talking about a significant increase in performance over our competitors. Now back to this, uh, this ambient illumination. We've eliminated that lamp barrier to allow a direct spike of light on top of the wall, and that means we've increased the efficiency to 79.3% efficient. Now, if you look up the wall, you can't see the LEDs because they're actually above the ceiling. So by hiding those LEDs, again, we had to come up with, with a good way to drive light out and down, so we use high-efficiency materials behind, our fixture, behind those LEDs to drive that light down and out of the fixture. The electronic version of the perimeter series brochure, uh, each of these little checkboxes, which is a different uh, option in the fixtures that we offer, each one of those checkboxes is a hyperlink to the spec sheet for that particular uh, for the fixture that includes that version. So if you need a six inch fixture that has a telescoping module, you click right here and bang, you'll be redirected immediately to the spec sheet for that, that has a, for the six inch fixture that has a telescoping module. So it's a nice way to, to, uh, to quickly find uh, our products based on, uh, on function and, and, and options. At the ceiling line, we offer just a very simple flange on the bottom of the fixture to carry the, the, the ceiling, whether it's, a, whether it's a, a wood or, or a jib or grid or what have you. But then we also offer a mud flange on the bottom of our fixture as well. So the bottom of the, of the jib or plaster ceiling can be mudded over, and now you've got a very clean uh, uh, aesthetic in the space with no visible flange at all on the bottom of our fixtures. Now, we have many ways that the, that the perimeter lighting systems can be, uh, can be installed. Uh, here we have an intra-wall, uh, I'm sorry, a wall-to-wall -wall application where the fixtures are, are touching the adjacent wall in the space. And again, the, the wall flange can be mudded in as well as the ceiling flange uh, can be mudded in for a totally clean arch uh, aesthetic in the installation. If for some reason you just want to mud the back of the fixture but not the, but not the ceiling, that's fine. Maybe if you have a wood ceiling, you're not going to mud over that. Or a metal ceiling or a grid ceiling, you can't mud over any of those. So we do offer that, uh, that ceiling flange on, on, on these fixtures. If you wanted to mud the, the, the ceiling, the drywall or plaster ceiling, but you don't want to mud the wall, maybe you've got like a wood wall or brick wall or stone or glass or cement or whatever, again, you're not going to mud over any of those. So you can mud the ceiling but not the wall as well. Or just don't mud any of them depending on what's going on in the space. And that's in those wall-to-wall -wall applications. In the intra-wall applications where we're not touch, touching the adjacent wall, our end cap comes all the way down to the ceiling line and it can have a flange on it, again, to interface with the ceiling uh, with, a, with either mud flange or no flange, and again, uh, we have uh, we have all those uh, all those different mounting options with those uh, intra wall flat, uh, fixtures as well. Um, we still offer some of our older, our legacy uh, kind of uh, kind of products, the legato uh, fixtures, the curved legato, and the, and the the V shaped legato. Those are individual fixtures. They don't have joining mechanisms here at the end, so they're they're made to be used like an, as an individual fixture in a conference room or a boardroom or that type of thing. 
We still offer the older style of products that, uh, you know, uh, uh, some folks, you know, they, they, especially the, the older uh, engineers and older designers, they'd like to just stay with the kind of same kind of stuff they've been using for 20 years. So that's fine. We still offer it. Uh, very similar to those perforated steel fixtures that you saw maybe 15 or 20 years ago uh, from our competitors. But ours are actually all aluminum construction, so they'll never rust in a high humidity environment. That's very nice. Uh, oh, another thing, uh, no natatoriums. We can do damp locations with all of our fixtures, but no natatoriums, no, no indoor pools, because the, the chemicals uh, in the air, uh, you know, those, those, those chemicals will eat right through uh, the, uh, the, the, the LEDs, the drivers, uh, all that kind of stuff. So no, uh, no wet locations and no natatoriums. But damp location in a, in a, in a non-caustic environment is just fine. Uh, we've reintroduced the round. Um, round fixtures were big 15, 20 years ago or so, but then they went away and everything turned into squares and rectangles. But what's happening now is, is the new generation of designers that are coming out of school, they don't want to keep doing the same stuff that their predecessors and the bosses uh, are, are doing. And so they, uh, so they, they look at, at these round fixtures and they think it's brand new. And for those of you that have been in the lighting business uh, for a long time, uh, well, you know, round fixtures are not new. Uh, uh, they were uh, they were they were super uh, super popular uh, 30 years ago and, and then they just went away. But so we've reintroduced the round fixture. We've given it rotation capability as well, so that you can uh, aim the fixtures in the space wherever they need to go. Um, we've also uh, given them the ability to independently rotate as well, so that you can have some fixtures facing down and some fixtures facing up or chasing left, chasing right, that kind of thing. 362 degree rotation, so you can basically aim them wherever, uh, wherever you want. Um, in addition to suspended versions, we also have wall-mounted versions that are either standing off, uh, off the wall with stems or, or in a solid body construction, and again, rotation capability in all those fixtures. Um, Soon we'll be offering a four inch round as well. This is, uh, uh, again, rotation capability, so that rather than just having the fixtures pointing up and down, you can also rotate and have them facing the sides, maybe illuminating the walls in a corridor instead of just the ceiling and the, and the, uh, uh, and the floor. So again, just giving, uh, giving a little bit of additional variety. The last product to show you is the G-Beam Portal. Fixture. This is this is built into the same housing as all of our other G beam fixtures, with all that ability to integrate into the space and and integrating into ceiling systems, wall ceilings, furniture systems, even. But rather than having that glowing white lens, we've replaced the lens with a backlit acrylic. This is a solid block of acrylic. It's very hefty, very heavy as well. So the fixtures do have to be uh, supported at more frequent uh, positions or closer uh, positions than if uh, than all of our other fixtures. Um, this. This is our competitor. This is the Mark Finn. Now, to be fair, uh, the Mark Finn was the first product of, its, of this style uh, in, into the market, and so uh, we have to give them at least that credit. But I don't believe they, they executed the aesthetics properly. Uh, they've got exposed fasteners on the fascia of their fixture. They've got uh, um, ex even the fasteners can be seen through the acrylic itself on the other side of the fixture. So in, in our construction, we have no exposed fasteners. We have no fastener shadows or exposed fasteners visible through the acrylic uh, of our fixture. In addition to those aesthetic uh, improvements, we also made our fixture capable to be installed in any condition, whether it's jip, grid, metal, fabric, any kind of ceiling system, stretch fabrics, uh, uh, you name it, uh, we can, uh, our, our fixture can be, can be installed into it. Uh, in addition to individual fixtures, we can also make continuous runs of these fixtures. There will be a gap between the acrylic because just like the lenses, acrylic does expand as it, uh, as it, uh, as it warms up, and we don't want the acrylic blocks uh, putting pressure on each other and creating cracks and, and such. And so we have nice consistent gaps uh, between the acrylic, whether the fixture is in grid, whether it's in, in, uh, in, in plaster, wood, metal ceilings, doesn't matter. Uh, they're always going to be, be a very high quality uh, type, of, uh, type of aesthetic. We offer 12 different models of the acrylic blocks, uh, ranging anywhere from uh, three inches deep to one inch deep as it's exposed from the ceiling. And as far as the thickness, we have inch and a half thick, and then we also have half inch thick here uh, uh, for a more, uh, more petite uh, kind, of, kind of look. We also offer two finishes. We offer uh, three sides of the acrylic as frosted, where it's visible, uh, it's a uh, see-through, if you will. And then we also offer all five, all five sides of the exposed uh, acrylic to be, uh, to be frosted as well. So in all, uh, a total of 12 varieties. If you, if you would like to know about uh, other options or maybe customizing this in some way, just give us a call and we'll talk about it. All of our LED fixtures offer RGB 
uh, uh, capability. This would be on DMX control, which is very common in the business. Um, uh, so all of our fixtures can offer that, as well as, our, as, as well as a white circuit as well. See, we don't do RGBW because we believe that the white in the RGBW, the white is often very weak. Uh, so we do RGB plus W, where there's, uh, there are two rows of RGB strip flanking a strip of high output white on a separate circuit. So, uh, so of course, if you need RGBW, we will, uh, we will do that for you, but, uh, but that's not how we go to market. We go to market with RGB plus W. The blocks can be etched, laser etched, to create signage for your customers. So even if they don't have a signage budget, you can actually create signage for them. And this is very valuable. You remember that, very, that big pattern of fixtures I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, where there's, there's uh, uh, um, you know, that whole run of patterns is, is, following the entire, uh, is going throughout the entire floor of that building. Well, imagine if you're, maybe you're, you're selling fixtures that are going to go into a waiting room at a medical facility like the urgent care or something. Well, you can have our, a, a standard pattern of, of fixtures with our regular white lens in the bottom of that pattern of fixtures throughout the entire space, but right where that pattern of fixtures passes by the doorway that leads to the examination rooms, we can, we can transition from the white lens to the, to the acrylic block, the portal block, and we can have that drop down from the bottom of the fixtures, and that block right there can be etched, and it says examination rooms. Or maybe on the other side of the room, uh, again, uh, rather than having the standard white lens just in one particular place in front of that particular door, we transition to the portal block and it's etched and it says pharmacy. So you're using the dynamic nature of that acrylic block to draw attention to itself because it looks different than the regular white lenses. And with the laser etching, now you're creating signage for your customer even if they don't have a signage budget. Now this is where it gets good. Because the whole thing is built in as a comprehensive lighting system, it's all one part number and one price for the entire system. So you're not having the VE conversations about that acrylic block section because the whole thing is part of one comprehensive system. It's kind of like when you buy a car and you want to upgrade the radio. You just tell the dealer, I want the better radio. And so you're only paying the difference between the standard radio and the upgraded radio. You're not paying for a second radio on top of the first one that was included as part of the car. And by doing that, you're creating value within the transaction. So we do the same thing. By building the entire pattern with one part number one price, the, the upcharge of that acrylic block only occurs in that particular portion of the run, but it's all built in as the same price. Now, as far as paint, uh, we use an automotive and airline quality wet paint. We don't do powder coat here. We, we still are one of the few manufacturers that uses a nice high quality wet paint, uh, which we paint here at our facility. This is an automotive and airline quality finish. Boeing has used this paint. Porsche has used this paint. This is good, good quality stuff. And so uh, quality is a very important part of, of what we do here. As a matter of fact, I'll just talk about quality for a moment. Every four months, every quarter, if we don't get any quality complaints from the field that actually cost us money, to solve, then we will pay all of our factory employees an additional week of pay as a quality bonus. Now that's a big incentive for them to be looking over each other's shoulders and making sure that everything looks and performs the way that it should before we pack it and ship it. Right? That's how you create partners and how you create interest by incentivizing people rather than punishing them. So that's how, we, that's how we operate. In addition to 13 standard finishes that we offer, and each of those standard finishes is shown on each one of our spec sheets, we also offer wood grain finishes. Now this is a little bit different. It's not a wet paint like we, like we do here. Uh, this, is a, this is a powder coat base uh, where the fixture is actually sent to a factory in Houston. We, we assemble the, the housings as much as possible. We send those raw housings to, a, to another factory in Houston. They powder coat the housing. Uh, then, they, then they take it out of the oven. They wrap the housing in a, in a film that has this, uh, this grain texture in it. Uh, they vacuum seal that film onto the housing. Then they put it back in the oven. That, uh, the, 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 the powder coat underlayer uh, becomes soft again, and it receives this, powder, this grain texture that's on that film. So when they take this out of the oven uh, and remove the film, uh, the grain texture remains. And they can do this up to 24 feet in a single piece just like we do. So you can actually create wood grain finishes up to 24 feet long all in one piece. And again, of course, you could have multiple housings joined in continuous runs, and it would just look like a bunch of pieces of wood joined together in a continuous run. The grain will not be consistent between one housing to the next because if you take any two pieces of wood and join them together, the grain is not consistent. So again, this is, it is in that way, we are consistent with what you would find uh, with, with, uh, with blocks of wood. Uh, <clears throat> 
that pretty much concludes uh, what, we're, uh, what we wanted to, to, to talk about today. The idea here is we want to integrate into the space. We want to become part of the architecture. We want to create value within the project. And by doing that, you set yourself apart from other salespeople and other organizations because now you're, you're meeting people's needs at a core values level rather than just selling them something. So, uh, so we hope that you see the value of that. Of course, please do come visit us. We'll take you through the factory. We'll show you how we build everything. Uh, it's a very clean factory. People enjoy it. Um, they, they, they enjoy the, the classroom time with us where we're uh, discussing various concepts. And, and these are interactive uh, times where, uh, where people can learn from each other, and, 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 we, uh, uh, and, we, and we definitely uh, enjoy um, uh, having, having guests here. And of course, uh, like I said before, after the classroom time is over, let's go out uh, for the rest of the weekend. Let's enjoy each other's company. Let's do the hot air balloon rides and, and do the crash landings that are so much fun and, and, uh, uh, and go see the vineyards. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, trip that we do down in, in Temecula. Our, uh, our local wine country down here in, in, in Southern California, Temecula, California. If for some reason it's too hot or too cold uh, down in Temecula, maybe it's too cold there, so we'll go out to Palm Springs. We go out to the beautiful uh, uh, Desert Springs uh, Marriott Resort uh, that's out there with their own uh, indoor uh, lake uh, and, and river and, and uh, uh, of course, all the cool things that Palm Springs has to offer. And, of course, uh, a tram ride up to the top of an 11,000-foot peak to look out over the entire desert uh, valley floor below. It's absolutely amazing. We have lunch up there, and we really enjoy that. Uh, if it's too hot to go out to Palm Springs, we'll go, to, we'll go out to the Pacific Ocean. We'll enjoy what that has to offer. We go to the, uh, the, the beautiful uh, 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 Newport Beach. Uh, um, uh, Newport Bay Resort, uh, which is absolutely gorgeous, beautiful rooms, beautiful accommodations. We'll go out on a cat catamaran uh, for a Saturday afternoon. We'll have lunch out there. There's all kinds of ocean life uh, out there. This was actually this was a live shot uh, that we took. That was a humpback whale breach. Uh, unfortunately, we, we, we missed the whale, but we got the, uh, we got the splash, and you can see uh, people get excited about that kind of stuff. So uh, just really, really neat things that we, we do here uh, to, to, to build partnerships, build friendships. Um, we hope that you see that we are a different kind of manufacturer, and we hope that you, um, you understand that what we want is partnerships. We want uh, alliances. We want to enjoy the people that we work with. And, and, uh, and spend our time with. We spend way too much time at work to not get to enjoy the people uh, and, and the projects that we work on. So, so that's kind of the moral of the story here at Gamma Lux. We want to thank you uh, for, for choosing to represent us, and we ask that, uh, that you uh, uh, help us to continue to grow as a manufacturer. Send us ideas. Send us uh, uh, um, opportunities to take, uh, take application photos. Uh, I'm, I'm always hungry to get, get new application photos, so please, uh, please let me know about that. And uh, that pretty much concludes uh, this presentation. Thank you very much uh, for your time.